Dumela, Sao Bona, Sakpa Se, Namaste, Abshin, Dubra Otra, Assalamu Alaikum, Hotep. Buenas noches, bonsoir, good evening. Welcome everyone to season two, episode 37 of the Doria Laria Show, where we invite people who are inspirational leaders to inform, instruct, and inspire folks to live life a little bit better than they did yesterday with some great information. Tonight is a remarkable, remarkable opportunity to have a conversation with someone who does not take pictures, but he makes pictures. When I saw that, I said, who is this man who is so bodacious to not, to say, mm -mm, I don't take him. I create them. And that is none other than Brother Chester Higgins. Brother Chester Higgins Jr. is an American photographer. Let's not just say he's an American photographer because this man has made pictures across the world. He was a staff photographer with the New York Times for more than four decades and whose work has notably been featured of the life and culture of the people of African descent. Please welcome right now, Brother Chester Higgins. Well, thank you very much. So nice to be with you. <laughs> it's so good to be with you. It's so good to be here with you. Uh, thank you so much for, for honoring me. And as I would say, considering it not robbery to, to think that yes, sitting here with me is, is, a, good, is a good thing, is a good thing. But we have to actually talk about how this actually started. This started about three weeks ago. Yes, <laughs> three yes. weeks ago, I'm sitting, I'm minding my own business <laughs> in a restaurant uh, in Park Slope. Uh, the restaurant is Gannett. Yes, yes. Right, Gannett uh, restaurant is Ethiopian restaurant. And um, again, minding my own business, having dinner with a friend. <gasps> was ble had blessed my food and then <laughs> as soon as I blessed my food because my food had come uh, there was nobody in the restaurant and brother Chester uh, and his partner were in there and I was like okay nope it was late he comes walking over and he says hi we must be very religious people <laughs> like, who's walking up to me <laughs> like this in a restaurant saying this and then i said okay well maybe and he goes oh i just i just wrote a book and i like to tell you about it and then literally this is my face <laughs> you're like okay <laughs> <laughs> and so i said okay well what's your name and he, he said Chester higgins and then i said wait wait who and you said your name again and i quickly went like this <laughs> hold on, hold on. And then I went like this. I was like, "Hey, wait, wait! I know who you are. I know who you are." So it gets gutter. You tell me about the book. The name of the book, Sacred Now. We're going to talk about that today. We're going to we're going to figure it out. We're going to talk all about this. But it gets better. I go home and I said, "I know I have something of this brother's. I know I did." Today, two, three weeks later. I go and look up another piece of information and I see this picture that has been sitting on my dining room table, on my coffee table for 20 years. <laughs> and it is, so if anybody's seen these cards, this is this brother's work. This is the one I love the most. If anybody's gotten a card like this from me, this is the brother's work. He's right there, he's right there. It's his work. This is Brother Chester Higgins. So I knew I had work of his. And now I have more. And now I have you. I'm so excited. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, I'm so, blessed to be here. Yeah. So tell me your perspective about approaching people in the middle of a restaurant in order to tell them about this book. <laughs> well, I do that sometimes. But, you know, I, as I, 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 I've been traveling to Africa for 50 years now. And, um, each year um, in 70, 72, 73, I spent summers, three months. And then I started working with the Times and I was relegated to my vacations. And I did six weeks each year since, uh, since 74, going back to visit my cousins. And- um, Oh wait, so you have biological cousins who live? Oh, no, we're all cousins. Got it, yes. You know, I mean- Family, okay. 
we're all family. We're all cousins. You know, I mean, it may not be my brother, you know, immediate family, but we're all cousins. We scrape down. We're all cousins. Excellent. I go and I, and I and I spend time with my cousins, and I enjoy the experience of being in Africa, uh, being with relatives, distant relatives, nice. and learning about the gaps that we've missed out by being here, by being removed here, um, and enjoying the people, enjoying the food, enjoying the culture. I feel like I'm reconnecting to parts of myself. Uh, and so that's what it, that's what it's about. This, it's a, uh, it's a journey. It's a, uh, and I tell people it's cheaper than therapy. <laughs> Wait, say that again. Say that again for the people in the back. It, <laughs> and officially it is mental health awareness day or something like that. Okay. Why do you, why do you say that? Why do you say it's cheaper well, than you know, first of all, when you, when you, uh, when someone who looks like us go to the continent, we blend in. We are part of the majority. We're not the minority. Amen to that. Somebody may not like you, but it's not because of what you look like. Your, mm -hmm. skin, your skin is no longer a target. So the whole issue, the weight of racism that we don't really realize is on us because we're in it every day. But when we're removed from it and it's not a factor in our lives, the whole issue of racism lifts off of your shoulder. Hmm. And okay. So here, you know, in, in Africa, you see white people looking for each other because there's so few of them. Never thought about that. Okay. <laughs> That's a flip. <laughs> it's a flip. Here we look for other black people in the, in the crowd of white faces. And there are white people look for other white faces in the crowd of black faces. Understandable. So. I'm Essentially, normalcy is us. We're no longer abnormal. We're mm. no longer other. I, so, I got so that in itself is is something that gives you uh, gives you space, gives you some emotional freedom to check out this new carefreeness that is possible for you. That's not possible in 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 uh, white cultures. So that's why I say it's cheaper than therapy. Forgive me, I have to sneeze. That's no problem. Uh, so in part of our, our meeting, well, I'm just getting better and better. And up until like a few minutes before we went live tonight. And so thank you for the people who are here, who are here live, who are also going to be here on the replay. Uh, please hashtag replay. Please share it with as many people as possible. Because it, I now feel even more so uh, during this year. And of course, this is evidence of it. That when you keep on the path that you intend yourself to be on, that people, yes, they do show up along the way to join along with you to help make the journey easier. And this is an example right here. And prayerfully by the end of the conversation, we'll have another beautiful gem that pops into, uh, into our garden for, for a chat. Um, so during the conversation, you were sharing about the book, Sacred Nile, and we were discussing it. And, um, you know, once I got over and stopped choking that I was actually speaking to me, Chester Higgins, uh, he's like, hey, you know, um, you know, we, we, he showed, he told, told me about the book. And um, a couple of days later, he messaged me, messages me and he's like, so did you get the book? And I was like, wait, I thought I just got the link <laughs> to Amazon. So I got the book. I got the book. Look, I got the book. So I actually wanted to unpackage this with you. So tell me while I'm unpackaging it, I'm actually going to mute myself because this may be a little loud, but let me know like how you started it, what the impetus is, and tell us again about that you don't take pictures. You make pictures. I need to hear that story again. <laughs> well, <clears throat> you know, all people deserve uh, the best. And... Um, taking pictures, which is I have no problems with, but that's not as a, um, for me, um, um, it can be quite suspicious. And there are many layers to us. And out of reverence to all of that that we are, um, I spend, the, I invest a lot more time in learning. That's how I was trained as a photographer. Uh, I was trained in, in visual linguistics. So um, <clears throat> everything means something. 
and your mentor is Pope? Well, I had several mentors. Photographically, my first mentor was a guy named P.H. Pope. Yes. And then, then, uh, then the head of photography at Look Magazine, uh, Arthur Rothstein, and then the head of the International Center of Photography, Cornell Kappa, and Gordon Parks, and Romar Bearden. Oh, wait, but, uh, I, know, I know Gordon Parks, and I know Romare Bearden. But before I got to them, my remember my uh, mentors growing up was my great uncle March fourth, who lived to die at one hundred and eight, and my mother's friend, a fellow teacher, uh, Bernice Brooks, and those people uh, were important in terms of guiding me. Um, Mr. Brooks was my social study teacher. He. One second. One second. One second. I have to actually just shout out to people that just popped on. So shout out to my camels. You know who you are, Dr. Tewitt and uh, uh, my big sister, Annie Scott from my alma mater. I'm so blessed that you are seeing this. This is the Chester Higgins of Sacred Nile. And uh, even though American photographer, 40 year plus uh, tenure at New York Times, but who travels the world, specifically Egypt, in order to take photographs. and. Give me a second. I've just unpacked it to the book. So this is my little cover letter. Excuse me. Now you got to pick out the plastic. I will, but I just had to like, <laughs> I, just, I had to do that. I had to do that. Okay. So go ahead. Yes. Now tell it, continue to tell. So please share this. Please share this video. When I was a, when I was a, a student uh, at my first year at Tuskegee, uh, I thought I was very, um, taken by the space age, and I thought I wanted to be an engineer. And I went to school, and but I'm from a little country town of 800 people, a little village. And the highest mathematics we had was algebra, not even trigonometry, not even geometry, and not even calculus. So at Tuskegee, I was doing good on everything except organic chemistry because I couldn't do the calculus. So I, and that was a big four credit course in two semesters of that you flunk out. So we're, the, not, we're not trying to flunk. <laughs> so the Dean of students knew I was a good, I was a hard worker, but I was in the wrong, wrong uh, area. So he said, look, you can come back, but you have to change your major. So I go home, just thinking this through. And um, on my way back after leaving my mother, I went by my great uncle Phil's house. And he was going out in the garden to pick some corn, ears of corn for Aunt Jewel to cook for dinner. And I began to tell, I don't know why I want to tell him this, because, you know, he, even though he's a carpenter, he, he, he can read and write a little. You know, there was no formal education for him, but he had what's called, we call in the South, mother wit. Or book knowledge. I mean, uh, right. Yes. Yes. So, I'm trying to tell him about the situation and he's listening to me and finally he turns around to me and he's also the caretaker for the cemetery where I spent many days going up to the cemetery with him as he would try to find places to, for new burials to be dug. Because mm. so many of our cemeteries, they put up wooden crosses and after so many years, those crosses fade away. You don't know where the grave is. So his job was to go find out where there was free ground when there was a new burial. Uh, to to have it dug. So he's listening to me and he finally says, he said, well, Chester, he says, whatever you decide to do, and that was a clue that told me he didn't have an answer for me. Okay. Or, or he wasn't going to answer my question. But he said that it's very important that you make a statement on life or you could very well die undeclared. Ooh, I get it. I get it. I did a ooh too. <laughs> See, wait, why is there like such like volumes and volumes of history and tales and saga and drama in like seven to eight words? I love it. I, we're known for that. So my ooh was like, what? Because here I am a 19 year old full of my 19 year old ego that tells me I could do this, I can do that, I can, I can be bling, I can be whatever, you know? And he's telling me that it doesn't have to matter. Hmm. 
So that sort of blew the roof off of my head and, and, it, and it, gave, it gave me a sense of humility that um, a 19 year old just wouldn't normally have. So I went back, I made my decision what to do and I pursued it. And, um, um, and I figured also he had the gravitas to say that because he has buried so many people. And he knows the difference between those who mattered and those who didn't. Mm. It did not have to be a New York City graveyard. It was a New Brockton, Alabama graveyard. And he's a caretaker. So he died at 108. And my partner and I, who had been together dating each other for 16 years, I decided, but we had start thinking about marriage. And I decided then and there, my mother also died in 94 when my book, Feeling the Spirit, came out. And Feeling the Spirit is where? That's where these pictures come from. It's a look at the African diaspora. Um, so after he died, we got married actually at his burial. Before the casket was lowered to the grave, the minister came and married us. And because I wanted my uncle Foth to be a witness, his spirit to be a witness, and my mother's grave was nearby. We both, and we both knew him, so she knew him as well. So that was the most, to me, the most sacred place to have to have this uh, wedding. Now, from, my, wait, wait, wait! Can I just coin it as from life to life? Absolutely. So my mother was there who, when I first started going to Africa in 1971, I remember my mother said to me, well, son, that's a very long way. But as I kept coming back, returning, her anxieties quieted and she started seeing pictures and she was happy and proud. But, you know, it was like a mother saying, you're out of, you are no longer within my reach for me to protect you. If those who know, y'all know I'm having a moment. Y'all know I'm having a mommy moment. Whole other video, but yes, yes. Yeah, just go, spread your wings. And then I found out, so in, but at college, we had African students. They were graduate students, not undergraduates. They were there for in the sciences and veterinary medicine. And this is at Tuskegee, correct? At yeah. Tuskegee. Tuskegee was a great place, great school, great place to learn and to grow. I spent six years here from 64 to 70. But these African students who I befriended, I befriended initially because of their music. Because in the dormitories, that's what you would hear. Mm. And then I began to spend time with them and I began to realize, uh, and, 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 and as they introduced me to their literature, and their literature was political biographies, which I started reading and I enjoyed. So I read the political biography of Kwame Nkrumah, several books of Kwame Nkrumah. There was another Nigerian brother who was there who uh, was a jeweler and he also had books. So that's why I became introduced not only to Kwame Nkrumah, but to Haile Selassie and Azikiwe um, and to Kenyatta. Mm -hmm. So it sort of made, it sort of emotionally prepared me that, you know, these people are thinking people and they're dealing with a lot of issues, issues that we haven't even thought about. So that my first trip to, to even though I went on my first trip in 71 to personally to Africa, I had to this nagging thought in my mind that, well, you know, not only, well, what if they don't accept me, but what if they are the, the what my racist what the racist people have been telling me, that you have no connection with them and that right. they're swinging from vines and they live the most primitive kind of way. I didn't know. I right. Just, whatever, I'm going. I'm paying my money. I'm going. Wait, I, what about the question of, are you going to be living in huts? Well, you know, I realized, <laughs> yes. You know, before I went, I found that white people were very, very um, generous with their negative uh, information about why I would not like Africa. No, I'm not talking about white folk. I'm talking about black folk. <laughs> well, you know, we are we influenced by the media. And our media, if you ever want to go to Africa, don't listen to the news. If you listen to the news, you won't go. 
Thank you very much. Africa, I see all these, not only do I see our brothers and sisters living in homes like ours with television and radio and, and, and telephones and stuff, but I see these large communities of white people. Mm. And I'm saying, what? Yeah. These people who are telling me that, that this is not a place I want to be, why are they here? And why are their cousins here? Living large. <laughs> And in charge. Wait, and in charge. Right. Not everybody is is working on the street. Right. There are people who are working in very big buildings. Right. Media, media. Who are owning the buildings? Who are owning the big corporations? Hey, they're. This is like the best kept secret from Black Americans. That yo. <laughs> <laughs> Did you? Oh, no, brother, Justin. you guys have been misled. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Let's take some from uh, Malcolm X. What is it? Hoodwinked. Hoodwinked. Bamboozle. <laughs> <laughs> and also, Malcolm also says something. Who taught you to hate yourself? It, on that, wait, on that note, wait, let's look at the book. <laughs> let's look at the book. Okay. At the, first of all, if you're a bibliophile, I'm a bibliophile. I have to, please excuse me, I have to do this. <laughs> I have, that's number one. You know what number two is going to be, right? Yes. Ah. I have to listen. Oh, wait. Did you hear that? Did you, I'm sorry. Did you hear that? Hold on. Wait. Okay. 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 I'm <laughs> Anybody, please ask questions. We have the Chester Higgins here of sacrednile.com. Sacrednile.com. Get, listen, get you a book. Now it, it is not it is not a coffee table book just to sit on the coffee table. This literally should be, and we'll say this like thirty five times during this evening. It should be on like the, the 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 shelves of young people. Gift your high school students. Gift your college students coming in there and going out a bit of African history in photographs mm -hmm. and story that they will not necessarily get on the required reading list or on the recommended reading list, but it needs to be on the list. All right, hold there, on. There is no reason for our children to continue to be fed the distorted story that our history begins in slavery. <laughs> our history does not begin in slavery. Slavery is an interruption of our history, but we don't know that and we don't see that. And that's what sacred now is to correct. This is just the first picture I've opened up. Yes. Oh my goodness. So actually I do want to ask a question. We're going to talk about a couple of things tonight. One of the things that um, I wanted to just wanted to talk about was the influence. And then we, we will, we'll go to one of the clips that you have. You have some clips available. So actually pull up whichever one you want to pull up first. Um, if, if you're still watching and I pray that you are, please share this out, invite some other people, invite some people who just love African history. Some people who have questions about African history. Some people who are just like, no, I'm not African, but I don't know where I came from. But, you know, my skin is like brown, browner than than the, the muddy earth of, I don't know, deep red Georgia. I, you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> but if you have ever had questions about who is with, thank you very much. Uh, let me actually put this put this up. Thank you so much. I'm going to bring up some comments and, and questions from our audience. Thank you so much. Yes, slavery is an interruption of our history and power. You are absolutely right. So this is literally my big sister who ushered me into Connecticut College. Shout out to the camels in the room um, and, and made sure I stayed there and got my black grip on myself. I have to say it like that. I'm from Brooklyn, but I'll take it. I'll take an accent from anywhere. Um, but I do want to uh, at least tap, tap into the images and uh, rituals or symbols or practices from, uh, and let's say as Martin Delaney uh, or Dr. Ben would even say from antiquity that still resonate in different word, in slightly different form and color, and those people who sit in 
in pulpits, let's keep it like that, who sit in pulpits will go through certain protocols and practices. But when you say this is also connected or we see the same thing in, some would say Kemet or Egypt, and they would say, well, that's that, that no, that, that didn't come from them. That's, you know, Greece and Rome and yeah. But you, you don't see the same story pattern? You, you don't see the same parallels? Mm, I, I don't know. It's just divine intervention. Okay. Help, help me out. Help me. <laughs> well, you know, they don't know. And the, the lesson they have been learning has been a corrupted lesson. They don't realize that one, that there was a world before Genesis. And that world before Genesis is where nature was sacred. Women was sacred. Balance was sacred. That's when you had the Holy Family. And I showed in the first page of the book, the Holy Family that is chiseled on the walls on the Temple of Amen. The Temple of Amen. You have the have this conversation. And that, and that chisel shows you, you have the Holy Father, Amen, seated. And across from him is his, is his wife. And behind him is his son. And in the middle is the king, the pharaoh, on his knees. Down, praising, amen. Because amen is the God that the Bible couldn't talk about, but they couldn't get rid of it. That's why the word amen is considered the most authentic and powerful word that you can say in any sort of prayer or scripture. And we have a conversation that it is used in slightly abbreviated forms in a multiplicity of uh, spiritual practices. They all say it the same. It doesn't get translated, but none of them realize where it comes from. <laughs> it was edited in, just like they don't realize that Sunday is a day that you worship the sun. They couldn't get rid of that either from the world of before Genesis. In the world before Genesis, we have a tomb. Now see, first of all, all of this, there are reasons for all of this. Not until 200 years ago could we read what the Egyptians, ancient Egyptians had to say. When the glyphs were translated, that's when the voices of the Egyptian began to speak. And the more that we read and the more that's translated, we get into this head of a very sublime approach to a relationship with nature. Because nature, we are a part of nature. Nature is us, we are nature. All of the animals and things in the, in the world are simply our neighbors. Mm. The strongest force in nature is the sun. Now, the Greeks thought that they had a way when they created Christianity of trying to demonize us, which is what happens in the Bible. The Bible plagiarized our people and then turn around and demonize the very people they plagiarize. On that note, I have to take a step. So the world before Genesis saw the divinity in everything. And because they saw the divinity in everything, the Greeks decided that they would, first of all, say that we are uh, polytheistic. We don't have one God. We're uh, doing, worshiping all these other gods. And if you don't know the religion, then you have to, you become, uh, you victimized by your ignorance. Mm. Yes, there is one God, the sun God, but it's not even the sun. It's the force behind, the sparks the sun. But all these other things are what they call netaru elements of nature that you can go and specifically appeal to. Now, let me say this about the woman, because this is the biggest change from the world before Genesis and the patriarch religion, which is the patriarch religion is a religion, is, there's a religion that's an enemy of the religion of nature. You'll find out as we go along how that enemy worked. <clears throat> to the mind of the Egyptian. The mother of the universe, the universe itself, was a body of a black, an African woman. They codified this 
in a painting that's all over tombs, all over papyrus, and this is what it looks like. Imagine you are in space. You could be looking through the Hubble telescope at a planet. And imagine you're looking at a planet floating in space, and over that planet is a black woman, long, lean black woman in a downward dog position. And she's in a downward dog position over the solar poles of the planet, not the magnetic. Come through, come solar through. Solar means her foot is in the east when the sun rises, her arms are in the west while the sun sets. Why? When the tired sun goes to sleep at sunset, it uses her hands to become a runway. It goes up her arms and she swallows it. Why? Because it's in her body that the tired sun needs the energy to rejuvenate for the next 12 hours traveling through her body. As it travels through her body, because she has a dress that has holes in it, the twinkling light of the sun comes out as stars. Come through. In the morning, her feet are on the east. Why? Because there's where she gives birth to the sun and with the spark of amen, it tears away the night. And the sun comes and gives and, and uh, activates all existence. So during the day, the Egyptians will have five times and worship the five places in the sky where the sun would be worshiped. Sunrise, sunset, mid-morning, mid-afternoon, and noon. Now, people say, well, but they are sun worshipers. No, they're not worshiping the sun. They're worshiping the power behind the sun, which is invisible and above us, and that is amen. To them, the sun was merely the window upon the residence of amen. Yes. Oh, so shout out to my mom. My mom is my biggest fan. She just put Nikki Giovanna soul tripping. Yes, 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 yes. So then the first thing that the patriarchs did is that they outlawed the woman. They outlawed her. Hmm. Eve, all Eve and 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 the energy of the of the universe, which is a, a snake symbol in the in the ancient Kemetic language, the energy was telling Eve to to pick knowledge. The apple represents knowledge. For that, she gets all universal sin is thrown upon her, and the man escapes like a rapist. She gets mm, she gets jacked up. No she kind of gets jacked no. up. She's mm -hmm. outlawed. She right. is the, her divinity is taken away and her can give birth. Her legitimacy as a birthing person is taken away. As a mother. As a mother. Thank you. Man becomes a mother. So, and, and, and then she becomes, how, how is she rendered even in Jesus Christ? She's a whore. Woo! What, why? Why? How? How? how is she rendered with Samson? She's a witch. Watch out for this. Then Samson, come on, come on, let, people. But then no, you take, then you take, people who are watching, y'all know the Bibles, the then, Bible as we read it. Please and, drop some comments. Go ahead. And then you take this boy Abraham. Now, let's talk about the world before Genesis. All of the symbols of humanity are divine, and they do divine things. Abraham, first of all, is a ref refugee from Iraq, Syria. They're all economic refugees. Okay. They have no food. They all were coming into Egypt because Egypt had water, which meant Egypt had crops. Right. So that's why these people came in. They were not Egyptians. They were foreigners. They were refugees. So the refugee comes in and the first thing he does is introduce slavery, sells his son. Even though the merchant may not have thought of, you know, okay, it's a trade, okay, I'll take him. And then 
Abraham has quite a relationship with different women, even taking the woman who's cleaned up his house. And then on top of that, you know, the Egyptians had very, very, very um, specific relationships with dreams. That's why you have the story in the Bible about the Pharaoh trying to solve the dream of the 12, seven years of lean cows and right. seven years of fat cows. So the first thing the Pharaoh did every morning is he downloaded his dreams to, to be to be written down. And people would go off to, the, to interpret it because they understood that dreams were advanced warnings. But no, what happened with Abraham? He don't get no advance warning. Abraham hears something in his head to say, go and kill your son. Go kill your only son. So we have a comment. So first of all, wait, let me say, thank you, mama. Eve was talking to, she should, Eve was talking to someone she should have been stepping on. Thank you, mama. And then Sister Annie says, women after Genesis, completely dismissed as a mother and denigrated as a partner before Genesis, everything is divine. Yes to that. Yes. And, and if you see me looking down, folks, I'm actually just trying to share this with as many people who are in my sphere of influence. Y'all know, just share this out. And my stream team, thank you very much for my stream team showing up, dropping comments, collecting thoughts, snatching things that uh, Brother Chester is, is dropping for us to is putting down so we could pick up, dropping them comments because, you know, we can't like remember everything. Go ahead, Brother Chester. Let me go back and show you about what Newt represents. Right, you had the picture ready? I don't have a picture of Newt ready. Oh, no, oh, that's okay. Newt, Newt represents continuity. Is, wait, is she in the book? Is she in this book? She's not. She'll okay. be in the next one. She represents continuity. I talk about it, but she's not there. Okay. She represents continuity. She represents creation. It is she who creates. So here's a paradigm again, where they flipped it. Instead of the, uh, and then you have Pata, who's also a creative spirit. Right. But, that, but that's been changed. Uh, but in a way, I guess what I'm trying to say, there's no paradigm, there's no theological paradigm that was not invented by Egyptians. The issue, the, the paradigm of creation, the, the paradigm of spirit, of soul, of ascension to heaven, um, the afterlife, uh, all of those are Egyptian creations. They are nothing, the Ten Commandments, those were stolen from the Egyptian uh, text, what is called the 42 uh, Declarations of Innocence. Right, or well, um, some people know it's the 42 Laws of Ma'at. Mm -hmm. Laws of Ma'at, because Ma'at was the, is the overriding thing in their whole society, over, the overriding thing in their culture, that there must be justice and there must be balance. What's the first thing that the patriarchs did to justice? They put They blindfolded her. You're right. Yes, you're right. Because if we don't know, we don't realize that the, the game that's been played upon us. So it's because, you know, then it becomes a tradition, it becomes habit. But it's a tradition that's, that's anti-African, anti-nature. And that's why then the, what happens to patriarch, it tells a man, okay, now everything is yours. You have the right to control everything that you see in life, in nature. So therefore you can declare war on nature and this book that we have written gives you the legitimacy to do that. You can now, the Bible gave him man the right to codify nature. Mm -hmm. Right, to, to which, which, have dominion, to name which, all things, to put mm -hmm. things into categories, like the original uh, mm -hmm. scientist, right? Mm -hmm. Who came up with the kingdom, the mm -hmm. phylum, all that, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You think the elephant knows his name is elephant? What? Okay, sir. You're, you're right. You're right. The A thing only knows that which it responds to. Let me say that differently. Or conditioned to respond. Oh, right. Conditioned to respond. We do it with babies all the time. We say, we call the baby, oh, you know, Daniel, Daniel, Daniel looks up. Yes, we give, you know, attribution. We say, oh, we smile. Okay, well, then when you say Daniel, then I'm going to look and get a smile. Okay. All right. So we have become afraid of our neighbors. 
we um so therefore we that's why you know a dog will only bark at you if you are afraid of it because then the dog is 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 advancing that thought if you fear me that means you will attack me hmm and that's what white people do to black people because they fear you they that that is a uh, that is a subconscious operator that says i'm willing to attack you because i i've given myself reason to fear and I've authorized myself to attack. Interesting. Okay. Okay. All right. It's an animal thing. Every animal can tell that. So it's that the, that intuitive thought or feeling or, mm -hmm. or sense. Every animal has that sense. Every animal can read another animal. So let's let's extend that a little bit and just say living being. Because, and, and people sort of, they recognize this when they meet babies for the first time. I just happened to meet like a, a like the grandchild or the great grandchild of someone mm. dear to me yesterday. And the baby is seven months old. At seven months, those who know child development very well, about seven months is called, um, oh geez, what's the term? It's, it's when children recognize that the person who is caring for them, if they're not there, they recognize them like, wait, 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 like fight or flight. So it's a separation anxiety. I'm just forgetting the term. So the baby, and I'm like, okay, I know the baby's still in the arms is about seven months old. I don't, I don't get too close to babies anyway, just because I don't want to get into their personal space. But the baby just sort of looked and just was like. Taking it all in. In a very positive way, whereas the older sibling who is a little younger, I mean, excuse me, who was older, very, you know, playful, but I expected for that baby to sort of pull very close to the, the parent. And instead they just stared. And adults know if a baby or a very young child connects spiritually, we don't really talk about it, but they're like, oh, I must be okay because I know this baby can what? Can read me. My spirit. Can read can read my spirit. Right. Let's let's go into the video that you have. I definitely want people to see that. The at, we already have 42 minutes. We just getting started. I'll we'll do a present and we'll do the video that uh, we made about the book. Uh, excellent. Okay. And those people who are still watching, thank you so much. Please share, invite people in. You will not have this opportunity many other times up close and personal right here. All right. So, so do I start this? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm going to put it up. Okay. And let me change the orientation. Here we go. I've spent decades in Egypt and Ethiopia and Sudan looking at the ancient artifacts and the ancient objects left behind that our people left behind in stone, messages for the future, snapshots in stone about who they were and messages that have been there waiting for the future for us to retrieve. I invite you to come with me to the Blue Nile, to come with me and see the pictures in Sacred Mile that shows our legacy as a people of faith making. This book, Sacred Now, will change how you see history, change how you see yourselves, and change how you see the sacred agency of people who look like us. Come with me from Ethiopia to Egypt. Travel the Nile, travel the history, travel our place in time. Sacred Now is the book that you've been waiting for. Thank you so much for that, that video. Let me change our orientation, get us back full in full effect. Excellent, excellent. So of course that was just uh, one of the <coughs> first videos will show one more but again this if again you have to be a person i think that fits into a couple of categories in order to appreciate a, a text like this if you are a visual person of course if you are a lover of the stories of before maybe you have gone to the continent maybe you're thinking 
I just think people still live, you know, in huts because that's all I see on the television. <laughs> or, you know, if you're a part of the the superstitious world where, oh, well, I keep hearing stories that, you know, if you go and you're like you touch this brick or you step on this line, this imaginary line, you're gonna fall to the depth. Listen, just dispel the myths, right? Just go, go. And there have been people, there have been groups of people, black people who have coordinated and orchestrated trips, trips to not only the continent, but to Egypt, to Kemet for decades, decades. Um, I'm blessed and honored to be a, uh, a child of what some people would call People call it a conscious community, but that's even getting a little murky these days. But I spent part of my college weekends uh, for about two to three years of my college stay at First World Alliance up at City College. And so even though I'm not in your personal space, but you were in my face at dinner the other night, you know, <laughs> but I sat in the back of rooms with the greats like Malefi Keti Asante, Ivan Ben Sertima, Dr. Ben uh, Jahakanan, uh, Dr. John Henry Clark, um, who just passed away, um, who wrote um, the, about the ball theory, the ISIS papers. Hmm, I forget. Uh, Francis Cress Welsing, Francis <clears throat> Welsing, uh, uh, Haki Madhubuti, the list goes on and on. And, uh, you know, Dr. Uh, Kar uh, uh, Malana Karenga, um, just trying to name a couple of others. But these people, I sat in the back of the room and I was just like, wow, they've gone to the, they've gone to the continent on more than one occasion. Professor James Small, who, you know, I've interviewed a couple of weeks ago, these amazing giants. And I was just awestruck how, they made it seem very accessible through their stories. They painted pictures of the land and the people that we only get a tiny bit of a filter from a very, I'll say it nicely, soiled. Skewed. Right. It, okay. Listen, I went to bed on many a night <laughs> and when television went off. Okay, at 11 o'clock with the, let's just say the organization that goes to like the, the, our cousins in Somalia, you know, or Uganda, where with the swollen bellies and the flies in the eyes. I went to bed like that for years. Well, you know, the thing, I to think. one of the things that I learned from Mr. Pope in photography is that <clears throat> when you analyze what is the default position when it comes to our enemies looking at us? They can't see our decency, they can't see our dignity, and they can't see our virtuous character. Hmm. Take our lowest common denominator and give it maximum exposure. So, hmm. therefore, when you start looking at their stuff, you realize that what comes out of their academic or their, their whatever is unreliable when it comes to us. Everything they say is unreliable when it comes to us. It's just inadequate. They have, the, they, they have an inability to be able to see us in a human way. So once you come to that conclusion, you begin to understand that it's easy to ignore them and to do your own primary research and look for different voices because their voices are limited. And all the people you mentioned who had gone and worked in Africa and who came back and who were still, uh, they had not been deformed or changed uh, physically. There was no uh, juju magic, anything that, was, that had affected them. <clears throat> you realize that, hey, why am I wasting, well, don't waste, don't waste your time. With, with with that stuff. You know, I even remember when I did the book, Feeling the Spirit, which looked at the, uh, before I did this book, there was this huge uproar, mostly among white academics, that there was no such thing as a world family of African people, that there was no African diaspora. That was a Jewish thing, if anything. And when I produced that book, I was at some college and some academic, white academic got up and was saying, you know, well, 
you know, this and this. And I said, finally, I said, well, you know, it seems like you have a book to do. I've done mine. <clears throat> Go do yours. But mine have shown the community of people on the continent, the spread across the Atlantic in the Americas, and the tertiary movement of former colonists, uh, co uh, colonial subjects going back to Europe. So go do yours. Mm. So I'm actually trying to, um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to put the, here it is. I'm putting the feeling, the spirit link. So there we go. If you, if oh, um, you. anyone who's watching, if you go into the comments and you can snag on YouTube, it's not showing on my Facebook, just go into the comments and that's the link for the book, Feeling Feeling Spirit, Junior Chester Higgins on Amazon. Okay. And let well, me just put this up. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thankfully, there are, but there are, you know, uh, by and large, a majority of white scholars are misinformed. But there are obviously, like Martin Bernal, there are a lot of white scholars who know the difference and who give us the, and who can overcome the inadequacies and the prejudices that are, that they are even raised with to appreciate the, 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 the true significance of what's in front of them. And that we'll, we'll, we have to say that all allies, positive allies, are very important and valuable. And we appreciate those allies. Sorry, I'm actually just pulling up Martin Bernal. If you don't know who that is, he wrote Black Athena. And he got a lot of uh, flack from other white scholars for saying, look, you know, uh, Greece is, is there is something that was before Greece. The antecedent of Greece is the African, is the, is the uh, comedic model. And people have, a lot of people have very serious problems with that because they have been trained and they have been raised on a diet that was skewed and that was corrupted. They didn't know that. So they were arguing from what they knew. They had no idea that who fed them had hijacked memory. They were reading the hijacked memory and they were victims of that. And they felt that in the, even without knowing they were victims, they felt that they had the right to then challenge what was true. They do the same thing with, with Herodotus. Some things they are willing to accept, some, but when it comes to Egypt and the black people, they have very serious problems with. Mm. And here's the, here's the link on um, Black Athena, Afro-Asiatic Civilization and Fabrication. And that's also, you can find that on Amazon. So if nothing else, this is literally like, this is class right here. This is master class. Okay. Oh, I may have to run that. This is master class. This is Doriel Larry's show. <laughs> and I'm speaking to our brother Chester Higgins of sacrednod.com, sacrednod.com, blessed and highly favored to, eat, to be in this space digital space, but be in this space with you. Uh, so I do want to ask, uh, I just want to go back again to the elements, symbols that you saw on glyphs, that you saw walking through, if you were able to walk through. And of course, the book definitely shows that you have been in tight places when you, like, just, oh, listen, listen, how, how do I just open it up and get to this? <laughs> That's like, what, what is, tell us about this picture. Well, what you're looking at is a page where one side, the right side of the page is from the temple of Amen, the temple of the man. And the right left side of the page is the temple of the woman in Philae, the, temp the temple to Isis or Us. See, now, to give you, let, let me give you a, a Christian equivalent here. That's the question I'm asking. <clears throat> in the Bible, you have the story of Jesus being born by the impossible birth. And maybe I should show you this picture. Um, can, I, can I share something else, present something else to you? Of course you can. Okay. Let's, let's see if this PDF will work. It says, oops. Okay. It, so I'm going to take down the other one. It didn't come up as a slide. Will it come up as a video file? Uh, hmm. Now, see, I can do this on Zoom by sharing this uh, PDF, but I can't do it here. Okay, so I have to talk about it. Uh, <clears throat> but let me, before I do that, let me do show you something from a minister. Yes, yes, yes. 
So okay. this is a term of minister that we all, that a lot of us in the black community and the black religious community know very well and love. So let's Reverend let's Calvin Butts of Abyssinia, who took his church, 300 members over to Ethiopia. I was there the year they, they came. Um, and who Hadi Selassie gave a ceremonial cross to Adam Clayton Powell for his help. Uh, so this is what he has to say about the book. This is coming from the pulpit. Hold on. Let me make, hold on. Let me just take this other one out. Are you able to take that first video down? Um, I don't want to kick you out. And I can, I can remove it. Okay. There we go. Good. Here we go. Yeah. Beloved, Chester Higgins is with us today. Stand up, Chester. <laughs> this is what the church should do. It takes us a little time, but we are culture bearer. We have to tell the story. Why you sit down, man? You're not that old. Stand up. I'm the one that's sick. Stand up for a minute. You Chester is a distinguished photographer. He worked for the New York Times for how long? 38 years. He's always been in our community. I've known him for a long time as a younger man he's running around with his camera, taking pictures, not only for the Times, but for our history, our culture. He's written a new book, or he's published a new book. It's called The Sacred Nile. This is the book. For those of you listen. He's going to be outside after service to talk to members about it and pass out some more cards. Deacon Dees has, walking Deacon Dees has some cards in the back. But um, this is a photography book about a river and how the ancient people who lived along its banks were the first to worship God. Spirituality is so important to us. Fellowship is so important to us. Our culture is so important to us. He... Uh, reveled at our going to Ethiopia. Uh, he has taken their beautiful pictures of the churches in here. He's an elder in our community. He's wise. He's learned a lot. And I want you to see this book because I'd like for you to get it. It's a wonderful coffee table, I think we call it book, to have in your living room. But, you know, we have to tell the truth about who we are. And it was, interestingly enough, Sigmund Freud, you know, the Jewish psychiat psychiatrist said that people of African descent were the first to come with monotheism. And uh, this book captures it so wonderfully and beautifully well. So uh, after service today, we're going to go out. We're going to talk to Brother Higgins. Uh, Kojo, where is Kojo? I saw Kojo here. Kojo is here. You all know Kojo. He tells us about all the cultural events going on in our community. He'll be around. So... Thank you, Brother Higgins. God bless you. And we look forward to you taking a look at this book because more and more the truth is coming out about who we are, what we've done, and how we've contributed. It's a pleasure. Show him some love and welcome Brother Higgins to the book. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing that. So this oh, is this definitely isn't something that is uh, limited to outside of uh, church walls and and uh, halls of uh, religious conversation. I'll say rhetoric, right? You know, the, these this these stories are, as we spoke prior, are pre predate a number of the religious practices that we see around our neighborhoods and community. And it's a blessing to be able, let me pull us up closer, there we go, to pull us, um, to pull us together and, and find out from whence, ooh, from whence we've prayed. What I try to tell people is that I'm not telling you to abandon Jesus, Allah, or okay. Jehovah. What I'm saying to you is that all of those things stand on the foundation of your people. This is all part of your spiritual and religious legacy. Yes, a lot of stuff, the most important stuff that makes up your faith is borrowed from the Egyptians. 
the Egyptians had a story. You may have heard of it. It's called Isis and Osiris. Those are Greek names. Their names would have been for the woman, Ost, and for the man, Asar. Mm -hmm. And what had happened is that Asar was able to get his agronomist scientists to become so efficient that Egypt could, could make three crops a year. And the breadbasket began to overflow. And they could feed their people. They could feed their all of their uh, uh, priests as well as the, 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 the armies to protect them. So in the, in, with the African heart that we African people have, and John Henry Clark criticizes sometimes, with the African heart of being generous, Asar decides that he's going to take a tour of the other third world countries, so to speak, at the time. And he is going to go and teach them the art of agronomy so that they too can sustain themselves by being settlers and farmers as opposed to just running after wild meat. He leaves this country and he leaves instead his wife on the throne, us, to rule while he's away. While he's traveling in these faraway countries, it happened he was there, gone for a few years. He had a jealous brother named Seth. Does this remind you of the Cain and Abel, two brothers fighting? Brother named Seth who pulls a coup on his wife, overthrows the wife, and makes her essentially a fugitive in the land. In her own land. In her own land. Over time, Asar returns, and the brother Seth has to step back because Asar is the rightful king. But he hasn't given up. He's going to kill this brother if he can. So what he does, he devises a big banquet and invites everybody and makes sure his brother is there. Yeah. And the, the point of the banquet at the end is to give away a free sarcophagus. A sarcophagus is out of stone, makes tons, costs a lot of money. So he makes a contest. Whoever can fit into the sarcophagus gets to keep it. Well, you can imagine everybody at the party tried to fit. Nobody could fit. Wait a minute. <clears throat> is anybody else thinking Cinderella? <laughs> is anybody, come, is anyone else thinking Cinderella? Well, you know, I'm Disney, just kidding. go ahead. Disney has gotten a lot of stuff from, from Egypt. So, regrettably, after Seth keeps imploring upon his brother to give it a try, Asar sits down, lay down, and guess what is perfect? And before he can move, the conspirators come and they put the heavy lid over it to right. suffocate him. So Seth kills his brother. Mm -hmm. But wait, there's more. And he not only he kills him. Enough, because he, he was afraid of his brother's spiritual power, he then chopped the brother up. Into how many pieces? 14 pieces. 14 pieces. So dismembered his brother and then made sure that he buried each piece in a different place. So, and the penis was thrown into the river and the electric eel ate that. So his wife hears of this horrible tragedy and she comes and she's wailing. She doesn't know what to do. She asks the spirit, please help me. And the spirit sent down a messenger, an angel, we will call them in Christian faith, but the mm -hmm. first angels were also Egyptian, sent down an angel and helped her locate all of these 13 pieces. And in deep grief, she kneels over these 13 pieces and reassemble them like a puzzle right. back into the body of Asar. This is the mm -hmm. first and wraps it all up because you had to wrap it. It was different pieces tied together. Mm -hmm. This became the first mummy. And then she is a virgin. They have not had a, a baby. They have not mm -hmm. consummated. Right. She then gets the spirit. She fills herself up with the spirit so much that she then becomes 
trans her, her body is transformed into a bird where she f takes flight over the body over the part that's missing the penis and she takes the seed of a dead man nine months later she gives birth to a boy the greeks call him horus right the commissions called him heru and then she and Heru both are fugitives. So she can't show her face because everybody's looking for her. They will arrest her. Especially they would be suspicious if they sees a, a mother with a boy. So what she does, she has to make some kind of money. So she goes and she becomes a market lady. Where, where do we know the story from? We know the same story, right? In the Bible, we know the story. Drop it in the comments if you know the story. So what does she do with her son while she's gone to the market? She made a little papyrus boat for him and stuck him in the rushes where he could be safe. He would not be discovered while she is off and can't protect him, but she's trying to make money to feed him. This little boat made of papyrus reeds is what Moses, I mean, uh, Heru lived in. Now, the story goes back to Moses, too. He, they put him in a boat, same boat, right. in the rushes. <clears throat> so the story of Isis and Asar and Heru is the first impossible birth. What is the paradigm of uh, Mary and Joseph and God? It's an impossible birth. Virgin, didn't have sex, impossible birth. This is the first one. Five thousand years before the Old Testament was written, because you know when you rebel against something and you try to create something new, you are you can't help it. But the mind is a prison to now. What do you know past now? When you try to create, what do you know past now? Right. So you have to deal. You have to reflect on what is known to try to come up with another thing. So yes, they took the story, they gave it a new name, gave it another thing, but then look, in the birth of Horus, the woman, there's a woman's spirit that must be there. The woman's spirit of Hathor, which is the cow. And when you see the images of the manger, it's no accident. They say, yeah, he was poor, but there's no accident. He had to be born to give this legitimacy. Hathor had to be at the birth. You will find that that livestock. Hathor. Oh, okay. So I'm making the parallel now of the story of Jesus born in the manger and the animals who were in the stable. Am I right? Am I yeah. right? Okay, good. Okay. Hathor sure. is she and Isis have their own temples, the temples of the woman. Mm -hmm. They have this power. So even today in Ethiopia, I was able to go to the temple of a woman, of the woman. And in that temple is built in, in the round. There is a, a huge a pillar, stone, uh, uh, no, wooden pillar in the middle. The pillar is probably about three feet wide and about eight inches deep. And in this pillar, when the priestess and the other women go into procession, uh, 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 possession, they fling themselves against this pillar. Why? Because this pillar has carved into it the four udders of Hathor. Okay, but why are they? So they're hitting themselves against. They swing, the they swing on it. They get. They get. They. 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 they, they swing themselves in their possession onto this column because they are making connection. Hathor is also a, a heavenly, uh, okay, page 68. I'm turning. Show us page 68. Yes, yes, sir. Yep. 60, here we go. Oh, okay, got it. So- With The priestess in the temple of the woman in possession, having now slung herself against the altar. And it's the altar of the woman. 
the altar of the feet of the of the uh, of the glands of life. Milk is the only thing, only liquid that gives life. And inside the temple, half of the temple is an enclosure for the cattle at night. Okay. We are all neighbors here. We are all the same ones. So that you're in the temple of the woman, the cow is a part of that of that structure. So in the next picture, you look at it on page 68 again, you see the Egyptian temple of the woman with the cow. Right. So actually I was looking at that. I said, oh, so, okay, folks. Now that's a woman's face, but no, no, go in the middle. Oh. You, you got the, that's a woman's face, but her ears are that of a cow. Oh, oh, wow. okay. I do see it. In the next picture you have the cow as the, as the guardian of knowledge, sucking from the night sky. That's how Egyptians learned. That's how they got their information from the night sky. The cow giving them the life of knowledge. Okay. Hold on a minute. So now I'm going to make a very kind of like esoteric statement, even though people who know how I, my eating choices, this may sound weird. So the food industry the F, the USDA makes a big deal about what? Us drinking cow's milk. Pasteurized milk. Pa pasteurized milk. A little random moment, but some people are like, well, wait a minute. Is this connected to like the cow's milk and like giving life and how people should really drink it? And is there something like, uh, like underlying about that? I, I still believe that animals' milk belongs to animals and not humans. It's Okay. That's okay. But, but I here we go. My son-in-law is Rwandan, and in Rwandan, they don't have coffee shops. They have milk shops. Well, people love milk. It's their culture. Cow is their culture. Egypt, cows were, were the culture. It's the, it's, the, it's the culture of wealth. It's the culture of what connects the family. My, do my granddaughter, since the, my son-in-law is a firstborn, his child gets a cow when, when that child is born. Yeah. Yes. And then <clears throat> when that child, when that cow has another cow, that cow is still the property of the of the of the grandchild. Okay. I mean, the father had the since he's first born, he has cows, but now his daughter has cows. So when she goes back to Rwanda once a year, she goes to see her cows. Wow. That's but the but the, in that situation, the cows are are gifts because they they identify with, with wealth. Yes. Yeah. And Hathor, they are a spiritual gift as well. They represent the spirit of Hathor. So, so what do we do then? And listen, I know my, 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 my spiritual family is, is watching. Think about the things that we gift. Cause again, part of this conversation, I really wanted to, to sort of focus on what are the, the symbols, the principles, the, 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 the rituals or practices that have passed through antiquity, through a variety of translations. Okay. And now, right, look, we see look them at, here. Look at the cross, look at the Ankh, how it became the cross. So can I just tell you that there was a huge, huge uproar within the, and you know this, within uh, the Christian community when during, I guess this would be the 80s, 80s, early 90s, when uh, let's say the comedic community came full forth and begun adorning themselves and reimagining, right? Imago Dei, um, shout out to the people who are who know this term from uh, the East New York church um, and utilizing the Ankh to represent life. And there was a huge clash, a huge clash of no, that's an Egyptian symbol. It's not, you know, we have to wear the, the cross that we know like that, but there's no, you know, this and that. So can you, for those who might not know, make the connection and uh, defra not defragment, but take apart the Ankh and its orientation and, you know, the parts of it and what it's supposed, what it means. Okay. I'll take a step at it. There are many people who believe that, that well, we know from the glyph that the, that the Ankh was symbolized life, eternal life. 
we know that the ankh was also the symbol of the sandals that the priests will wear. Hmm. You have the strap, you have the place for your for your ankle, and you have the strap for your big toe. Uh, there is a reason to believe that the ankh also represents uh, uh, <clears throat> civilization, or life, uh, humanity. That the staff itself represents a male force, that the, the oval represents a female force, and that the arms represents the offsprings. <laughs> But the cross itself is also a holy figure that the Egyptians have because it represents the four winds. So one could, yes, one could compress the oval as your part of getting rid of the woman, but also there is a the, the equilateral cross of the four winds was something that was also there. It wasn't as prominent as the Ankh. Now the Ankh also could represent something else that's very interesting. The most important time of day for the Egyptians were when the sun came up and when the sun came went down. Hmm. Sunrise and sunset. They began to worship in their temple an hour and a half before the sun arose. So when the sun arose, being farmers, that was the end of their worship. And now they could go farm because the new day has arrived. Newt has delivered continuity. So now, what if you take this ankh and you lay it down flat, but you bend the circle up so that it's 90 degrees to the, to the body of it? Okay. That gives you an horizon line. The arms become a horizon and the circle becomes the sun. Okay. All right. I'm envisioning that. Now, and the reason I say this is because in the Bible, there is a time when Jesus was being captured by the Romans, soldiers. And he was talking to his traitor, and he said to his traitor, because everybody is awake, he says to his traitor, before the cock crows twice, you would have denied me thrice. He's mm -hmm. talking time of day. Anybody who lives on a farm knows that the rooster starts crowing before the sun rises. Mm -hmm. City people may think it only happens at sunrise. No, it happens before. The rooster will start crowing at least a half hour or more before the sun. They get that spirit. They know it's coming. So that meant that temple worship during the time of the Jews in Jerusalem followed the same calendar as the Egyptians. And guess what? The Ethiopians follow the same daily calendar. If you go to Ethiopia and you go to a church, unless there's a special service, during the daytime, the church is empty. Why? Because the church was filled at 4.30. Yes. And the church emptied at 6. Why can we say 6? Only on the equator is an equal where the sun will go down at six and the sun will come up at six. In fact, if you go into an office in Ethiopia or somebody's home and they have a clock on the wall, chances are that clock is not going to be what you expect it to be because that clock will represent uh, the big, one hour of the day is six. Six hours of the day is 12. 12 hours of the day is uh, sunset. Sun, okay. You look at the person's clock at your home, you say like, hmm, my watch says it's 1030 and their watch says it's 230. How could that be? <clears throat> okay. All right. So are they counting from like four, their 4 a.m. is our? They're counting from sunrise, from appearance to the point that when the sky, when the sun has torn the dark sky away, that's when they count. That's day. Wow. Okay. And then when the sun disappears, that's night. That's 12 hours later. So if you go okay. into Ethiopian's home and they have a clock, they know what it is. They know they can translate to the, to the Western, but it is their tradition that this is how they tell time. 
Okay. Uh, and I actually have to shout out to uh, uh, Reverend Richard Honeywell of African Journeys, who, when I met uh, brother Chester Higgins, I said, oh my goodness, you have to uh, connect with this brother. You have to, you know, make some sort of connection because he actually takes uh, annual trips to, let me get it straight, to Ethiopia, to Ethiopia for the Timcat. Timcat. The, the um, Timcat Tim Festival. Yes. Right. Which is around the time that we, if I'm not mistaken, celebrate Easter. Yeah. Am I correct? And then the two weeks difference, the Orthodox calendar is two weeks difference behind this. Yes, yes, yes. And he and when you said you know the whole the time change, I remember him telling stories about that. Like you know, like listen, people be in church from four a.m. in the morning, and we don't finish the worship and the celebration sometimes until the evening. And so you're in church sixteen, seventeen hours, and then people are like we've been standing for a while, we haven't eaten, and then they break their fast and they have this huge feast. But the huge feast is like in the middle of the night. Because they've been in church all day. This is the cal daily calendar of Jesus Christ. This mm. is the daily calendar that Jesus Christ learned from the Egyptians. So you have to go back to, I say, you know, people don't, I'm not telling you to abandon Jesus Christ. But understand something. Jesus Christ would not have been alive if it wasn't for black people taking him in. Okay, say more. Then they protected him and they trained him. Everything went well. So who were the black people? Huh? Who were the black people that took him in? The commissions took him in. The, and the commissions are the? The ancient Egyptians. Thank you. Because when you say commissions, people are just like, well, what does that mean? People from Kemet. K -E -M -E -T. Yes, from Africa. Right, and the glyphs would actually spell it K, for those of you who don't know, K-M-T, to say it, to articulate it, there has to be some vowel in it, and so it then sounds like Kemet. Because the language is consonant-based. They knew where to drop the vowels. We have to learn where to drop the vowels. <laughs> we got to take an extra class for that. <laughs> They're like, you don't see it, K-M-T, Kemet. But as I say to people, be proud of the fact that Egypt was the was the birth spring of Christianity? Was the and out of Christianity, out of Judaism, Egypt was the birth spring of it. It would not exist without Egypt, without the thoughts of Egypt, without the terminology of Egypt. Jesus would not have been alive if it wasn't for Egypt. And to show you the truth of it, his problem was when he went back to his people, not when he was with us. Mm. So he so is this an example of he was a stranger in his own land? No, he was preaching peace. And what is the Old Testament? Nothing but war. The Old Testament is a very mm. aggressive book of war, only war. I found I it's all war. It's not peace. The Egyptians were more like Buddhists. They were into peace. His people didn't want to hear about peace. They were only into destruction. So yes, the rabbis wouldn't like it either. Their their whole book is about destruction and about thievery. How do you destroy people and take what they've got? And that's not what Jesus had learned from our people in Africa. And when he tried to bring that to his people to change them or enlighten them or convert them, they did not want to hear it. And so today, um, <clears throat> as we are, we've, mm, how, how can I say this? And people, please, you can chime in, you can ask questions. Thank you so much. People are sort of sending up uh, emojis, but drop a comment, ask a question, perfectly fine. You have this man who is on our show. He's right here. Uh, so I'm, I'm definitely just blessed to be able to try to see antiquity through your lens. Yes, I did say that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and blessed and honored. Again, we're just talking about uh, Brother Chester Higgins' text, Sacred Nile, which he's allowed me to have a gander at. Gorgeous. It smells amazing. That's just for the bibliophiles. But the, the pictures are of such, I can't even say high quality because trust me, I didn't go to photography school, but 
Y'all know I, I have an Android camera and I, our Samsung is actually better than the Apple. I'm just saying that. But um, the, the, the photographs are just are thing just to behold. Like I can't even go into a museum and see some of these images. You, you can't, you can't, you're not gonna do it. But the making of these stories in this book is, to say it's a mood is a total understatement. That doesn't that it doesn't even grasp it. As I'm even as I'm flipping through now, and again I've seen some of your work, I've seen some of your other videos, and in the chat I actually did put a couple of the videos that he has linked. It's in the chat if you just go to the very top, you can get a glimpse of how this work has, of course, come through. Uh, come through time and uh, and space has captured things that things that we see. For example, like some of the image actually that I just showed of people probably sitting in prayer and they had their head draped. Um, the first thing I think of is, oh, am I looking at something from like the Ten Commandments, right? With the Yule Brenner and whoever the woman was that played like. Cleopatra or something like that. But, you know, I'm, I'm looking at something and I'm like, no, those are things that are happening right now or not very, this very second. And there is this, there's a time gap that is crunched. It feels like this is the days of Jesus. Like this is 2000 years ago because we see people sitting in the temple. We see them, you know, fasting and praying. We see the priests swinging, swinging the, what do you call it? Like the, the incense. The censer. Thank you. The censor. Um, and I often sit in my, uh, you know, in, in my house of worship when I go to different churches and I'm, I just look, especially when I go to, uh, let's say, Orthodox ministries, if it's like a, a Roman Catholic or I've been to a mosque. I was in Morocco this summer. And so I was in um, the, the, the mosque in, in Morocco and I just look at the ornate, the elements. And I wonder why certain things continued, why certain things are the same, and why certain things were discontinued. So when I asked you about certain things that um, we got from antiquity and are evident in our practices today, like utilizing amen um, across genre, right? Across the aisles, as I say, or if we... <coughs> If let's say that like the sensor, although in we, that do, we, do, that, we don't have that. We use we do fire for incense. We do water for baptismal. We do uh, we make okay. offerings, yeah we make offerings in water or or a milk. Um, all of these you know um, the when the, the Egyptians invented the playbook for how do you establish uh, a holy spot to have a holy conversation with the creator. Okay. That's what ritual is about. So whether that is transported into, let's say having your own prayer closet, mm -hmm. building your own altar mm -hmm. within your home or that quiet place, like the, you know, the, the, <laughs> the code words that are used that again, depending on denomination, because then I think of, let's say Latin, let me say Sp Spanish speaking families I have to be clear now, Spanish speaking families, let's say if they're coming through um, Puerto Rico, if they're coming from Colombia, Venezuela, and the, how they, and people who've also come from some other places in the Caribbean, IET, for example, and how ca religion came through Catholicism, which is connected with, right? Um, African spiritual practices and, worship practice. I'm trying to just use very careful words. So I don't get like thrown off the air, <laughs> but um, how it has been transferred into uh, uh, divine worship of ancestors or uh, spiritual, I want to say possession, but that has like a really interesting connotation that some people don't really read very well. But if we say in the Christian church, like fill with the spirit, right? Some other groups may use another phrase. Um, it's when I see uh, people in the in Latin countries, and when they go into worship, they have a very specific dress. You know, the head is covered in white. 
you know, they had these, the women had these big sort of what we would know as like almost antebellum type, you know, bo tight bodices, but then filled skirts. Even today, spiritual Baptists, I always, I'm always thrown into what is that the remnant of? Well, you know, the white represents uh, two things. Uh, the light of the sun, the God, hmm. and also where we will go when we die. If what you, about purity? What about just plain purity? Purity is fine, but there's also when you die, your bones are bleached. Once the skin falls off, your bones are bleached to white. So it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a celebration. See, Trinity originally, <clears throat> as the Egyptians pre saw it, is the celestial, the physical, and the spiritual world. And that's what every service is trying to deal with, trying to connect. The wait, wait, say that again. Say that again. And somebody from our stream team, write that down. In, in, in religion or spirituality, there are three overriding elements that you give name to and that you, uh, 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 you pay attention to and you try to have a, a relationship, a conversation with. So celestial, the sun is in the celestial, the spirit, God is far, is out of our reach and above us. Okay. <clears throat> the physical, the physical plane on which we live, would we, and we have access to God. Uh, God, you know, does not need a celebratory chamber to find them. God exists. Right. Everything, wherever you are, outdoors, just fall, worship, look up, it's there. We're, we are in God. God mm -hmm. is. And then the right to passage from here is the spirit world, which we hope our passage to the spirit world is one that goes peacefully, one that goes um, on des by design, uh, that takes us to takes our that uh, that takes our spirit. Because see, death is not an end in the Egyptian mind. Death is a door. <clears throat> you go out of this experience and, and death then becomes a door that takes you into another, another reality, another experience. And mm -hmm. it keeps circling. Because how, what else could it do? We live in a contained universe. There's no way of getting out of this universe. So everything has to recycle itself. Okay, so I'm um, now again. I, I I sit I sit in a number of rooms. I'd like to say it like that. One would say uh, a number of of Christian denominations would say, um, you know, we leave this world or we leave this body and we take on our new body. We take on our new clothes. You know, our, our we have our spirit body that continues. That's why you have, that's an Egyptian concept. Like that's why you have mummies that they will rise up on the day of judgment. That's where that comes from. Uh, little side note: I was I was watching a some sort of documentary on YouTube about a group in Madagascar. There we go. Um, a cult, a community, not culture, a community in Madagascar who part of their ceremonial practices for transferring their loved ones from this life to the next. Let's put it like that. Uh, part of their funeral practices. Very, very, very interesting. And today it still continues. They, you know, the person passes, they they will, and some other cultures do this. They lay the, the person in the home. People will come to do the wake. They come to visit the home. The If it's a spouse, the spouse has to sit in the room. You know, actually, yeah, she sit on the bed. I'm sorry, I'm going through this. But it's the, the practice is very interesting. And it's almost like um, uh, an antiquity and mummification. They go... They sit, then after a couple of, a day or so, two days, then they go and they, they what we can say, they dress the body. They dress the body. They put the person into like a very interesting position. And then they go and they bury the person, but they bury the person by actually just wrapping it in cloth. Then they take what we do in, with a coffin. They take the coffin and the, the men, the sons, brothers, they put it on their shoulder and then they dance to 
the site. They put the person in the site. Then like a year later, they actually, what we would consider, they removed the person and they have a party for the person. They changed the clothes of the person. They put fancy clothes on the person. They, But then that's not it. I mean, that there's more. Every couple of years, the practice is that they have a celebration for the person again. Where else did I see that? Actually in Mexico with on November 1st, the Day of the Dead celebration. It's very, it's just very interesting how some cultures, again, from antiquity, whether it's the idea of mummification, it's the idea of that a person leaves this world and goes to another world and then there's activity. And so we have to make sure that the person has other, and people, it's just beautiful. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. So, and, I'm, and you've captured this work in this book. You Do you teach any of this in other, any other spaces? Because I just have to say, I may have to have you back. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. But let me say a couple of things. You know, my uh, great uh, uh, grandmother and grandfather, there's a picture I have <clears throat> when she died. Um, and she was laid out. And, they, and, and we call that, they call that back in those days, cooling boards. You, come on, church folk. You know we use that phrase, a cooling board. You know we use that phrase. And yes, the Egyptians kept their dead in their homes. Once they were mummified, because it was very expensive to dig tombs. You had to have permits to dig a tomb. You need to have some money. It takes a while to dig a hole in a rock. These are miners you had to hire. So what we're looking at in tombs are rich people and powerful people. But the other people embalm their people and they put them in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a coffin and they stuck them in their house. Now, how do we know this? During the time of the Roman occupation of Egypt, the Roman taxes, the Egyptians felt were too heavy and they did not want to pay them. So to escape the Roman taxpayer, the Egyptian men ran to the mountains when the taxpayer time came. So there's a Roman law that says, okay, take away their coffins of their dead ancestors. They will come back. And that's what they did. The soldiers came. They didn't pay their tax. They took the coffins of their ancestors away. When the news reached the people that the coffins had been taken away, then those people then came back. And Wait they, a minute. The coffins with the people in them? Yes, with the with the mummies in them. <laughs> grave robbers? That's what they've always been doing. But they didn't the grave was in your house because you had them stacked up on the walls of your, you know, your immediate ancestors and then your grands and your greats. So if the soldiers came and took them, what are you going to do? You, I, ha, wait, ha, wait a minute. I, I got to, I know you're telling the truth. I just got to, I just have to figure out how to look this up. Go ahead. Ro, so wait, the Romans did this? The Roman taxation on the Egyptians. Wow. Somebody else looked this up as well. Okay. Roman taxation on the Egyptians. Egyptians who, it's who uh, avoided tax, paying their taxes. What did they do? Wow. Taking. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Wow. You're right. I'm, of course, you're right. I'm sorry. Wow. You got, look it up. Just look it up. Look it up. There's like seven articles that I'm looking at. The other thing I want people to look up is the name UNAS, U-N-A-S. U-N-A-S. Oh, I'm going to type it in the chat. <clears throat> UNAS was a holy father. Now in my next book, I, instead of saying king of Pharaoh, I was just calling them what they were. They're holy fathers. And that's what the Pope is trying to copy. That's a holy father. 
The Holy Father Unas was buried 2500 BC. If you add that to 2200, that means that is 4,700, almost 5,000 years ago. He was buried underneath his pyramid. Now, the name pyramid deserves an explanation. Pyramids as you see them today are raggedy. Why? Because the thin skin, white limestone skin that covered them has been stolen, has been taken away to build the huge mosque and, and office buildings in Cairo. But before that happened in the seventh century, because the Arabs invaded in the sixth century, seventh century, they looked for, looked for quarrying. And to them, that was a very effective quarry to work, just take off that white limestone. But look at what that line, white limestone did. It reflected the sunlight. It brought God down in their presence. And until the Eiffel Tower was built, those 35-story pyramids were the tallest structures on the planet. And the only reason those pyramids are not in, in England is because they're too heavy to steal. Everything else that the French and the English could steal, they stole. And only when King Tut came on the scene did, they, did the Arabs decide that they were going to keep it. They weren't going to give it to the foreigners, which caused a lot of problems. But in, in hindsight, it was a very good decision. So I did look up Yunas. Uh, the first thing I came up with is, it's actually from Wikipedia. I know Wikipedia is subject because it can be edited. You can do <clears throat> But what's important about Unas, that in the tomb walls of Unas, he has three rooms in his tombs. There is the, um, a treasury. There is a center that you come through out of the shaft coming into the tomb. And then there's what, the burial chamber. And the tomb is two stories high. What's significant about this tomb, and it's only three of them that exist, is that chiseled in the wall of the tomb is hieroglyphs that goes from the floor to the ceiling, 331 lines of hieroglyphs. And this hieroglyph is all scripture. This is the first holy scripture, the earliest holy scripture in the world. How do we know this? History is divided between what is written and what is talked about. This is what is written. And in this scripture, he talks of creation. He talks of the concepts of faith, spirit, death, afterlife. And he talks about specifically the ascension of the Holy Father's spirit to the celestial rim. And it goes specifically to one place. It goes to the belt of Orion and specifically to the left star on the belt itself. The belt of Orion has seven stars. In Revelation, they talk about the queen with seven stars. They're right. talking about the belt of Orion. It's the holiest part of the sky. It's where the holy fathers and holy mothers, where their spirits go when they die. So I just want to show this. This is the image that comes up. That is a causeway to Unas. His okay. pyramid obviously is not in good condition. Is better underneath than on top. But the causeway was a place in how you had this long procession where the body of the Holy Father was carried by the priests through an, through an area that had a slit of light that came through, mm. also covered with all of, about what is happening in his lifetime, pictures everywhere. They invented photography before paintings and everything else. <laughs> And all of that was, that was to bring him from his temple where you had the, uh, uh, the services of interment would happen at the temple at the water. And then afterwards, the services that would take him, the processions and ritual that would take him actually to the pyramid for his body to be entombed. And then you would have in that tomb, after he's put in, then you would have a shrine built around his body. And that's mm -hmm. where have, first of all, his body would have uh, three different golden 
coffins. And I show you what those golden coffins look like because we now that we have found an intact tomb of Tutankhamun, we know what those golden coffins look like. So I want to bring you to you uh, to page uh, two hundred and twenty-four. Got it. And show the people what a golden coffin of eternity looks like, because these pyramid chambers was your you was your uh, palace of eternity. So show the people what one of these coffins inside. There's three. Right. Coffins. Now you're going to see one of them. Right. So those of you who went to the Museum of Natural History in the 70s, I think that's when King Tutankhamun was brought to the United States. And our right. Am I correct? It was yeah. in like mid 76, 70, 78, 70s. Yes. Right, right. Shout out to my mom because she was she went uh, back to college and I was with her every weekend. And I remember specifically going to this exhibit. That's him in one of his three coffins of eternity. No. Well, so wasn't it that it was like a, a coffin within a coffin within a coffin? Three coffins. It's like it's like the uh, the Russian dolls. Oh, which is a gold coffin inside of another gold coffin, and um, let's see. Uh, now, on the twenty eighth of October, because in November twenty second marks the one hundred years since the King Tut uh, grave was desecrated by tomb robbers. They say discovered. You know, how they use that word. Go to page two hundred six. Yes, sir. Page 206 is a golden mask that was the centerpiece of that exhibition. They didn't have the golden uh, coffins, but they had the golden mask. Yeah. This is what we this is what we were all what was all on. Right. In his tomb, there's 250 pounds of gold worked into art. I gotta flag these. So if I, I ask people who know anything about the value of gold, look up the price of gold today. And a pound is 16 ounces, the, and the price of gold comes in ounces. Mm -hmm. So you have to multiply, if it's a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars, what the value is today, multiply that by 16 to get one pound. And then multiply that number by 250 to get the value of the gold that is buried in the, in the tomb with King Tut after the tomb was robbed. This is class. This, this is class. This is class. This is class. So now on the 28th, there's an immersive show coming to New York down at South Street Seaport. I okay. think it's called King Tut New York. You can look it up. It's an immersive show coming to New York City for about maybe a month, from October 28th to probably November 28th or the 1st of December. And it takes you an hour to go through it, and it's all projections. I'm going to go take my granddaughter. I suggest everybody go and get your ticket. You can get a ticket. You can get a ticket to be on time, or you can get a ticket where you got to wait two hours. It's up to you. Get your tickets. This is the most famous black man in the world. The richest black man in the world from the most powerful empire that ruled the world. This is his story. This is what his the meaning, the significance of what we have learned from his life. Got it. It actually, yep. It says, uh, so you can actually find it on Time Out New York, uh, an immersive King Tut exhibit bringing ancient Egypt to New York City. I said September 7th, but that means it's coming and it's going to be 417 Fifth Avenue. I'm going to put the link in the chat. Don't let the white people outnumber you in this. And they are understandably, they are going to go I and mean, in great numbers, but don't, don't let that happen that you, that you don't see it too. You go in equally great numbers. All of you need to, they know his importance. They know what, how valuable it is. You need to know how valuable it is. And you won't know that thoroughly unless you go to this exhibition. And as I say, in the, in the major museums in the world, 
what distinguishes them in terms of their their uh, <clears throat> excellency and in terms of their uh, reputation is how much of an Egyptian collection they have, not how much abstract paintings they have. Wait, then who has? But how much Egyptian art they have. The Egyptian art is the most expensive. Wait, and the best. wait. at the museum? Whether that's the Metropolitan, the British Museum, the Louvre, the new museum in Germany, the museum in Russia, whatever it is, what sets, what puts a museum on number one tier is their holdings of Egyptian artifacts. Your stuff. And see, the, one of the things I wanted to do with this book is get, that I've always been frustrated by is that Egyptologists stop at the border of Sudan, the northern border. Hmm. Sometimes they go in midway because they got to do Nubia, but then they want to see Nubia through Egyptian eyes, which we were able to change with that book I did 10 years ago called Ancient Nubia. But what I found really frustrating is Africanists stop at the border of Nubia too. They just give Egypt away. <laughs> they just like, they, they get so confused by the foreigners who invaded it that they can't see the, the, the underlying pharaonic culture. They can only see the foreigners. So say, well, well, the Greeks were Egyptians. Cleopatra or the Romans were Egyptians. Wait a minute, the Persians, so were the Persians. So were the Assyrians. But they did not build the culture. They came to rob the culture. Hmm. And, right. And that's one thing that uh, Professor Small usually talks about. Yeah, they came to rob the culture. So, yes, it was a rich culture, the richest culture in the world on the planet. And they did a lot of robbing. And guess what? This culture lasts for thousands of years and none of those other cultures last, lasted for a thousand years. Hmm. And all they were doing was sucking the African tit, so to speak. Uh oh. And they couldn't survive because they did not have a culture of regeneration and peace. Their culture was only of destruction and thievery. So when they even stole the Bible, they couldn't deal with the regenerative part of it. And that's why they're, you know, Martin Luther King is right. It's a house that's on fire. That's their culture. So when you look at Egyptian art, you look at any art, there's a, um, there's a look that these people have. You just can't place it. They don't look like you. Mm -hmm. They don't look like anything that you know as human. They look like they must be in heaven. They got to be some with the enigmatic look of an Egyptian face. Show, tells you they are from somewhere else. And so is that why... Uh... There are groups of people, and I can't really name the people at this moment, where, well, actually, I could talk about Dr. Ben, because I've heard him say it a number of times, whether it be live, because I've seen him live, or, of course, on tapes and videos, um, that the Egyptians that we see today, I don't want to misquote him, but let's say aren't the Egyptians that we know of. The Egyptians we see today are Arabs. They're, they don't even name their country Egypt. The name of that country is the United Arab Republic, MIRS, M-I-S-R. We, mm. as us, we call them Egyptians. They don't call themselves They Legally, they are not Egyptians. They are Arabs, the United Arab Republic of Egypt, which Nasser put that phrase down. Now, that doesn't mean that they, uh, but also everybody's interested in seeing this culture. It's a huge tourist attraction. And it now brings more than a, than a quarter of their foreign exchange. So they have to embrace it. And I'm glad they do. But, you know, there's another force going on in, in Arab and in, in what we call Egypt. And that's the force of the fundamentals who want to destroy all of the temples. The same way the fundamentals destroyed the Buddhist statues in Afghanistan. Because how they read the Quran is that this is not a picture, first of all, in the Quran, there's no pictures are allowed, just like in, in, in Hebrew. So therefore, this is has nothing to do with the worship of, uh, of Allah, so it should be destroyed. That is not unique to them. This happened during the time also when the Turks, Turkish Empire took over Egypt. 
And there was a story where the Turkish general who came, who was in charge of occupying Egypt, uh, was approached by a Greek scholar saying, look, there's these huge warehouses and we love to, we're curious, we love to know what's in those papyrus in these huge libraries. Mm -hmm. and, and this uh, general says, well, you know, I don't have the power to open up, but I'll write my emperor and ask him what he says. The emperor wrote back, if they have nothing to do with Allah, burn it. For six months, 24 wow. seven, fires burn to consume all of the scrolls that were in these warehouses that nobody was bothering, nobody knew about, except when these uh, Greek scholars asked the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the conquering general if they could have access to look at it. <clears throat> I, I'm I'm blown away. I'm blown, not literally, but I'm blown away. This this work is extremely powerful. It is extremely vital to connect dots. I know there is uh, in the religious community. I'll say in my religious community over a couple of a couple of years ago, there was a huge conversation about um, we really need to be reading up on the war uh, that Palestine is in and and Israel. And I was, I couldn't engage in the conversation just because I wasn't really familiar with what the essence of it was at that moment. That being said, this story is from antiquity. This story is of, with the story that we're telling through Sacred Nile, the story of, you know, like the war between Palestine and Israel is of, you know, people trying to recognize who they are through their own lenses trying to see themselves, I'm making sort of a photograph or photography comparison, trying to see themselves with a the lens that somebody else is, is giving them, trying to find the trueness of who they are, not what people see, but who they are inside. You've done that work to capture those, those images that tell stories, the stories that people don't want some other people to know because it will call them out. The stories of people who get hidden, who are marginalized, put into the background, and the things that society would say, if they really knew the truth, they'd be turning the tables. Well, thank you very much. I've been trying to find the truth, but you know, when I grew up, they said, if you want to hide something from a black man, put, huh. it, in the book. put it in the book. So what I've also tried to do here is not try to tell you what it is, but give you the evidence in pictures to show you where it is, what it looks like, so that you can go there yourself. You can take this book with you and you can go and look for these things. But let me, but you touched on something about Palestine and, and the Bible touches on the same area. You know, <clears throat> Monito, who was uh, the last uh, priest during the Greek time to talk about the, the uh, Egyptian history says that the uh, Hyksos, so people that we don't really understand very much about, but they were Assyrians who came into the Delta because, you know, Egypt was a great place, but, you know, egos and greed gets in the way. And in the Delta, you had a lot of that. And that is what was fermented so much of the problems about Egypt. It took it down several times. And it came back up. But the, so in this political instability in the Delta, you had different princes who felt that they should be in charge. So one prince decided that they would import mercenaries to come in <clears throat> to fight on their behalf and, and, and put down the rebellion. And these Hyksos soldiers came in and they put down rebellions one place after another, and they turned around, they realized that they could run the country. And that's what they did, they took over. And for 250 years, they occupied Egypt. In the end, this is between the 12th and 17th dynasties. In the end, they did two things. They marched on Waset, which we call Luxor. Mm -hmm. And for the first time, the Theban kings and royal families had to flee or be destroyed. And they fled to the south, to what we will call now Abydos or near the border of Nubia. Okay. 
And the reason they fled is not because they didn't fight, but because they were outmatched. The Hyksos brought something new to the war theater that they did not know about because the Egyptians fought on foot with bow and arrows facing each other. The Hyksos brought what was called the ramming chariot. Horses pulling this big chariot and they will essentially ram the front lines of the Egyptian soldiers on foot, just plow right over them. <laughs> and just continue to plow over them, and then you've got a decimated ranks. So the Egyptians lost against the Assyrians. They licked their wounds, they escaped, they abandoned their, their uh, royal city, and they went south. And it took them another generation to come back. But when they came back, they still had this ramming chariot, this battlefield strategy that they had to overcome. So the Egyptians came up with a very novel idea. Never having used uh, chariots before, they developed a chariot with two horses, an artillery chariot. One person drove the chariot and the other person fired arrows. Hmm. And they came up, they made this chariot so that it could have more maneuverability than a ramming chariot, that it could actually turn. So they came up with a strategy that when they go against the enemy line, all 100 chariots on one line will be firing into the enemy. Once they get almost close within reach of the enemy, they will then make a U-turn and the arrow guy will turn around and keep firing again as they moved away from them. So assault after assault, U-turn uh, assault after U-turn assault is how they defeated the Hyksos. Hmm. And they drove them back out of all of Egypt into their citadel called Avaris, A-V-A-R-I-C-E, which, okay. <clears throat> which is on one of the mouths of the Nile near Alexandria. They set up, they locked, the, uh, the Hyksos locked themselves in this, uh, into this huge citadel, which was big enough that one of the, uh, one of the, the channels of the Nile ran through it. They could, they could grow food, they could protect themselves, but they knew that if they come out on the field again, that the Egyptians would defeat them. So, Akmosis, like Moses, Akmosis, mm -hmm. <clears throat> the last king of the 17th dynasty, the first of the 18th, the new kingdom, made a peace treaty. Yes, this is class. Akmosis made the peace treaty with Apapas, who was the king of the uh, Hyksos, and says, okay, I want you out. I will guarantee your passage out. I won't attack you. Take everything you've stolen from my people and leave. And my army will make sure that you can leave safely. But if you come back, I will destroy you in the battlefield, open battlefield. And you know it. I'm going to take you out. A papa's left. A papa's then cross where Moses never had to cross the Red Sea, which takes you uh, a, a, a full day and a half to sail across. Uh, when there was a 200 mile footbridge that everybody uses, they get from Egypt to the Sinai to, uh, to what's called the Middle East. Until the Suez Canal was built, that footbridge, footbridge was still there. Class. So, Apopas goes back over the footbridge to try to get back to where he's at. Imagine this 250,000 people with Apopas. Now, the geopolitical dynamics have changed in the last 250 years. Who were his allies in the past no longer exist. Kingdoms, individual kingdoms have turned over. So if you imagine if you're in a kingdom and you see 250,000 migrants or refugees coming at you, you don't know what you should think. Is this an invasion? Should I, should I fight them, protect them? So the Old Testament is full of nothing but wars. Those wars are the battles of the Hyksos trying to find footing. And finally, they give up going back north, east, and they turn and they go towards the coast, which is made up of city-states. Canaan was all city-states. So let me ask this question. Now, again, you spent 40, 50 years, I guess I'm answering my own questions. Did When you were at Tuskegee, was any of, because I'm trying to now make the connection of why this book needs to be in the hands and on the shelves of 
universities. What kind of information did you get about African history? Well, when you were at Tuskegee, and we're talking, you said the 60s. I got African history because of my friends. Tuskegee taught American history. Okay. But that was a history that they felt, you know, that the academic felt, well, this is what you need to make a living. So you learn American history, but hey, we've been learning American history since, you know, the junior high school. Mm -hmm. African history was something that I had to independently study. Most people, I'm sure, not only have Black Americans have a conflicted relationship with Africa, but part of that conflict has caused them to do value, the knowledge of why should I learn about this? What is this all about? Without realizing that by not knowing it, your ego, your sense of confidence is com seriously compromised. And only when you learn it do you begin to reinflate, <clears throat> not from some from some perspective of of, uh, of jive phoniness, but just realness. So I had to learn all this. You know, you see this library behind me. This is one of three. Yes, I believe so, it. <laughs> my library is where I spend my time learning and reading, and and mostly rare books to find all of this information. So let me finish with the Hicksaw story. Now going back to Canaan, yes. once Apopas has settled himself by warfare by conquering the city-states of Canaan, there were a group of priests from the temple of what's called On. When the sun comes, the world is on. There okay. was outside of Cairo, and now it's in what they call a, a suburb called Heliopolis. These priests, this set of priests led by a priest named Moses, petitioned the Holy Father Achmosis to go to Avaris and purify it. And he and this priest, they get permission and they go do this. But you have to, then he writes a letter that's treachery, treasonous. He writes a letter that's sent to Apopas saying, look Apopas, we have taken out Avaris, come back, it's yours. Now, why, why would they do such treason? First of all, you have to remember, if a foreigner has been in charge of your life for 250 years and you've been raised to, to respect them as your leader, it's not unnatural for you to have these feelings that, hey, you know, you've been done wrong, come back. But a papa said, no, you come to me. So those priests went to a papa's. And then what my feeling, and I don't have proof of this other than supposition of how things worked out, because these were the invaders of Egypt. These were the conquerors of Egypt. These were the oppressors of Egypt. But the Egyptian priests knew how to write uh, narratives that were divinely inspired. So the Egyptian priests essentially rebranded the, the hip Hyksos into the Hebrews. Okay. Right, they became the victims. And in this victim story that they then recreated for them, they then pulled and pulled a lot of stuff that had to put that they was in the Egyptian annals. That's why it's all there. And then you have to ask yourself, not only is there no need because of the 200 foot, 200 mile footbridge, but <clears throat> The holy deeds, chosen one is an Egyptian paradigm. And I made a picture of that because I want people to see. Whenever a new holy father, a new holy mother came to power, they had to have a ceremony in front of Amun. And Amun had to choose to reach out and say, you are mine. 227. Show the people 227. Wow. Two. Okay, this is at the very end. Oh, okay, okay. In stone, under the canopy of heaven is Amen on his throne. In front of him is a new king. Amen reaches out to the new king to bless him, to choose him. Chosen one. Choosing the person who's a leader by extension chooses the people they're leading. The, the, our ancestors knew we will forget this. That's why they put it in stone. And they, that's why if you cannot go to Egypt, you've got to get the book. 
<laughs> get the book of something. That's your beginning. You'll go to Egypt. If you get this book, you will be pulled to Egypt. And you will go and see, see what I've seen. Go see it. And then you know you gotta go back more and more times. You're gonna read more and more. But you know, you start. So then the 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 other last thing about I have to say, and 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 you know, I say this to my church members about the old testament. One, the the Egyptian uh chosen people's Egyptian paradigm, everything else is. But if you are the chosen people. And God protected you from being what? You were overworked, right? Mm -hmm. And but you were you were not underfed, but you were just overworked. And that was enough for your God to deliver you. Am I right? Now, what happened when millions of you were burnt to death by Hitler? What was your chosen God then? Good to keep in mind. I'm not answering that question. <laughs> I'm not walking into that one. What are, What are your thoughts on that? Well, it's, there it just shows it was an invention of uh, you know of literature uh, to try to give you the, uh, the, the give your story a certain. Uh, spiritual or divine legitimacy wait which was never there wait back up what was what was an invented story the whole thing about uh your the the, the uh exodus story is an invented story to give your to give your narrative a divine uh, uh authority okay okay the first five books are all uh, you know, they are all, they were done, I mean, in a clever way. I mean, the, the Egyptian priests are very smart people. That's that's their training. It was done in a very clever way to rebrand these people who were the invaders. So this is, this is the question, and we had this conversation before uh, we came on. Uh, I'm always intrigued when I hear, when I hear a different, I'll say a different twist on that, which I was raised on. I am still looking for the moment for, let's say, a, a person of your cell or a person of your caliber and of your, your training to have a real focused con, uh, contextual dialogue with those who believe that the Bible, let's just take that text um, inherent word of God, which is what we're taught and sort of like, just compare the stories, just compare the stories. Cause I, I, and this is no, cause I know mama's still watching. I still love the Lord. I'm, I'm there. But when it comes to taking the story that we know that we've been taught and then looking at other, I'll say not denominations, I'll say religious beliefs and how there are some stories that are, they're just parallel stories or like a statement that you just made of like the first five books. So we're talking Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that in, from what you're saying was designed, I'm going to use that phrase to do what? To give it a, to give it us a, 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 a sense of divine authority. And this is an act of divinity that happened. And in this act of Moses going to the top of the mountain, this is an act of divinity that happened. And it doesn't, and it's so unique and so rare. It doesn't happen all the time. It happened that time. You know, religion is uh, always seemed to be about a past uh, event. And a past event that was an intercession between those three things, the celestial, the physical, and the spirit. And we like to think that when those things come together at the right time in the right way, we hit the lottos. The lotto happened. And because the lotto happened that way, we, whatever was surrounding the lotto at the time is divine. 
And therefore, we can build a divine belief around that and know that, hey, we're in the right direction. But I tell people, look, the Egyptians understood spirituality, and that's what they had rather than religion. But they understood what they were trying to do as, they, as, as naturalists. They're saying, look, we live in a perfect world. Now, we humans can be quite cantankerous. But maybe things we can make we can make progress if we can replicate the perfection of nature among ourselves as a society. And I think that's what the aim of the priests was about. And that's what they achieved. And that's why they achieved, because they were able to get people collectively to move in one direction, as opposed to our individualness wanted to move in everybody's same direction. So there's a parallel world. There's one world that we can move in one direction, trying to replicate the perfection of nature, as we then have to move in our own direction. So as we move in our own directions, how can we make sure that individual behavior feeds into the collective behavior? That's why you had the moral codes, the moral compass, which we call the Ten Commandments or the 42 uh, Negative Confessions. Mm -hmm. now let's look at the Ten Commandments. In the Hebrew Bible, the tense changes. You've now in you've now dealing with a God who is telling you, "Thou shalt," as right. opposed to in the world before Genesis, you're dealing with a God who's right. accepting what you the responsibility you put on yourself. Right. What well, you should do, like I will. Uh, I, have, no. I have not done. It. I have not sinned. I have not committed this. I'm not. You had a responsibility to be part of the whole. But in the, in the new uh, oh, in the Old Testament, no, you don't have responsibility. You can't act on your own. You can only act because an oppressive force told you to. Hmm. Now, but let's get back to fundamentals. Now, even though religion, as we know it, is an African is a born African theology, my point is, why would any god? have to reduce itself to my language. God speaks in thunder. God speaks in lightning. God speaks in the forces of nature. God gives you air. God gives you light. When you, when you sleep at night, God is giving you breath. The Egyptians talk about it. It's a nature, a nataru, nataru. God mm -hmm. gives you light. When you open your eyes in the morning, you've already been blessed by God twice. Not to mention you've been blessed by during the night, just you know, being able to breathe. So fundamentally, this whole thing about the word of God is a human construct that we feel we need, but, it's a, but we need it because we use it as a control system with each other, which nothing, I'm not saying that, I'm not, and that's not a value judgment, but I'm saying God does not need to speak to you in English, German, Yoruba, whatever. God mm. is nature. That okay, okay, okay. Wait, so I'm gonna make a connection here. Um, oh, okay, I got this. There are groups of people who go across the world in order to infer or really declare that there is one unit, one one set of words that should be used to have people pay attention to a moral code. If not using that book, if you operate outside of it, then it is said that, you know, you're, you're not of the one. I use this statement because I've had conversations with other people about it. Um, before, let's just say before Europeans got to places, let's say in the mountains, in the valleys, what have you, and people, now I'm speaking about African people uh, who are, yes, monotheistic. And actually, Professor Small had a another phrase, I think, maybe monofocal. Someone just had this conversation with. Anyway, the idea is that if they don't, if, if a group of people don't use one specific book, it is thought that that they don't know God nor respect nor honor that there's a, a creator. But when you see a group of people who respect the earth, 
who um, have a set of guidelines that they operate so that they can work in harmony with each other, who take care of their young, who take care of the, their elders, um, who protect themselves. As I grow older, I just have a harder issue with if it's not one specific text that the people don't have a soul. Do you understand what I mean? Two things. When I One thing I did take at Tuskegee, we had a world religion class. Mm. What I found amazing about that is that everybody could find a divinity. They may call it different things. Right. And I will, you know, I'll use a local analogy. If you and I are going to New Jersey <clears throat> and we need to cross the George Washington Bridge, Mm -hmm. You may take the West Side Highway. I may take the East Side Highway. But <laughs> once we get to the bridge, we can agree we're on the bridge. We we did. <clears throat> we all beat up. <laughs> Number two, people do choose to try to put themselves in, in in these walled structures because they think that there's safety there. Hmm. But the problem with religion is that religion builds walls between people. I don't want to be walled in or out from anything. The third thing, we don't have to be taught what's right and wrong. We innately know that. When my granddaughter does something and I say to her, well, you know that was, you know that was wrong, didn't you? She said, yes. Well, why would you do it? Okay. Well, okay, I hope you don't do that again. But I learned that from my great uncle March 4th. As kids, he would do the same thing to us. We would do something and we did something wrong. We knew it was wrong, but nobody called us on it. And when he called us on it, he didn't say, stop that. He says, you know what you just did was wrong, don't you? And we didn't, we weren't able to read the Bible, but we knew, yes, what we did was wrong. Innately in your spirit, you know it. That seven month old that you went to would have known if you had done something wrong, if it did something wrong. It's an innate thing that God has put inside of us. <clears throat> We don't have to have a book to name it. We don't have to have a book to say it exists. It does exist. It exists outside of any book that you can think of. Even those who don't have books with that know. Even those who don't have books know that the sun is something that is blessing them from above. That sunlight and water is blessing them. Mm -hmm that God is giving them something. They can't give it to themselves. No other human can make it and give it to themselves. The mind knows that, but the mind wants to play a game also. And, the, and once the mind decides it wants to start playing a game, you gotta keep it interesting. So you gotta make this, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta make, okay, you go here, you turn left. Well, you're gonna turn right and then go down to here to make another U-turn. The mind, is playing a real game on itself. But, you know, that's not a judgment. It's, that's how the mind works, and some people need that more than others. And it's okay. But you don't need any of it. For those people who, uh, who feel like they need to have parameters, stories, a hierarchy, a fellow travelers on the same road. Right, right. The community, community uh, to to fill in the gaps, to give uh, validity to what, because if you're saying that innately or spiritually, we know the difference between right and wrong. We don't necessarily have to, but some people feel that they do. Some, it's okay. It's all right. Um, then there are religious tenets that people can abide by that connect with certain cultural, you know, like places and spaces um, and ways of thinking. This text, Sacred Nile, should it be in the hands of people in high school? Should it be in the hands of people in universities? And you and I had a, a, a conversation of who it should go to. And I had to declare a decree you shouted out one group of institutions and I had to represent the other set of, of institutions. Those people who know me away, I went to school, not afraid to say it. I'm a Connecticut College alum and proud of it. Uh, 
but uh, you said you were interested in, in connecting with HBCUs. And for those of you who do not know, that is historically black colleges and universities. And I had to make it clear and evident. I said, yes, they can, but PWIs need it as well. <laughs> we may need it a little bit more than some other people. Um, Everybody needs it. And white people, yeah. <laughs> because white history has been so subjective to hijack memory that they don't even know their history. And they definitely don't know ours. So I think it's good for all Americans to know this history because it shows and it, it helps us all have a, a larger appreciation of each other. This is our glorious legacy. We should, once we know it, we will embrace it. And it makes us feel uh, more complete knowing it and, and make us feel, my other thing about is that, you know, I don't want us to be a victim. And I think it's it's horrible that we teach our young people that their history begins in slavery. No, slavery is not the beginning of our history. Slavery is an interruption of our history. And as you learn your history, then you say, okay, well, if we were this, this once, how can we go and be this again? Yes, you gotta overcome stuff, but hey, you know, you don't get a diamond without pressure. You're right. You're right. And this is part of the pressure that we need. It is part of the pressure. As many representations and as many examples of representation of uh, of of the story in its full truth <laughs> should be shared across the world. Whether it be now, those people who know me, you know where this is going, right? Y'all, y'all know that this is going in my bag. I'm taking it to work tomorrow. Uh, it will see all. It will sit on my desk. <laughs> Most people already know it will be sitting on my desk, uh, open, open. Um, but I'm. I will listen. I will do my part to to share the information. I hope that the people who are watching and some people have literally been with us for the entire two and a half hours, Professor uh, Brother yeah, Tessa. We've talked two and a half hours. Oh my I god! Oh, and you said, and I said, we'll probably go over an hour. You're like, no, it's not. <laughs> an hour and a half in addition time, but it has been a beautiful conversation. Again, those people who have connections with universities doesn't matter what. No with spaces of educational thought. Spaces of educational thought. Let's get this book. Let's share it. Let's have conversations. Let's get on a plane. Let's get the passport. Let's go to Egypt. <laughs> but wait, can I say before you go though, before you go to Egypt, the Egypt that we know now today, please read some of the texts that we've dropped in the chat, whether it be Black Athena whether it be um, some of the works, again, by Dr. Ben or Dr. Clark, um, some of the uh, uh, other works by um, um, Brother Chester Higgins. Through, whether, you, whether you learn by the words in the text, then, get, then go get you a Black Athena. Right. That's, that's a deep book. It's, a, it's long. I'm telling you right now. If you learn by, vis, by, by um, visuals, you can't fight with a camera. You can't fight with a camera. You can't argue with a camera. Find the information somehow and share it with someone. Youth groups, whether it be the, I'm shouting out all the civic organizations, let this be a book talk. Whether it be Divine Nine, let it be a book talk. Share it. Gift it to your younger. Um, there's always like we're trying to reach down, not reach down, but reach to the younger generations. Gift it to them. Gift it to them, whether it be, again, somebody's graduating from middle school, someone's graduating from high school, someone's in college trying to study some history. Please include the Nile history in the conversation. I'm just saying. Thank you. Oh, let me just put up these last couple of comments. We've had some really great, amazing people. Thank you, Jennifer, for popping in. Thank you, Sister Annie. Yes, we we can. Um, okay, can go with that divine intersectionality uh, again. Why? Why? Why would God need any God? Why would any God need to reduce himself to human language? Say that again. Yes, God speaks in nature. Even those who do not have a book or those who cannot read, they know there is a power blessing and providing spiritual guidance. Yes. Oh, thank you, Sister Anissa, for sit, for staying with us. Right, Sister Anissa, you can't fight with a camera. The camera's going to show you what it is. It is what it is. And last comment, say that slavery is an interruption of our history. Brother Chester, I'm, I'm only pausing because I have to go to bed. 
<laughs> but I love you enough to say through this screen, this is not the last time. Especially if not before, because this was class. This was class. This was class. This literally, this was like my shout out to the memory of Dr. Vincent Bakpektu Thompson. I have to say his name. My African history professor at Connecticut College, who we worked diligently to get him to our campus. To the memory of Professor Ferdinand, who was our economics professor who diligently taught and corralled the African and African American and Caribbean students together and taught us 30 years ago, 30 years ago about Kwanzaa for the first time. To help me, help me, Sister Annie, who is our photographer at school? She's gonna drop it. He just passed away a couple of years ago. She's gonna drop his name. Um, but these black men when we saw them, we saw ourselves. We, he, they painted pictures of, a, of us in antiquity from a historical perspective, from a visual perspective, and from an economic perspective in terms of building societies, how we need to learn our own story before we show up in spaces. When we're in spaces, that when someone tries to tell us who their history of us, we need to, as we are raised as Black people, you need to be twice as good for yourself, really. But to be considered only half, right. but you got to show up and be and be correct. So again, in essence, your 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 education, or as my big brother would say, your training is not complete <laughs> unless you have this book. And it's, it's Wakanda uses the the, the Egyptian yeah. transition, the crossing out of the the negative and positive force. That's right. In front of the temple, in front of the priests. Thank you very much. I am. I'm blessed. I'm so blessed. I'm so blessed. I have to find. Wait. He just. I have to find his name. Don't go anywhere. Um, photographer. Photographer. Connect, come on, Connecticut College. Come on, uh, Connecticut College. Oh, oh, it's on the top of my t my tongue. Barkley Hendricks, Barkley Hendricks, Barkley Hendricks. Thank you, Barkley Hendricks. That's the person I'm thinking about. Um, yes, three amazing black men who walked tall and proud on campuses of our school, which. Again, it's a predominantly white institution. Um, but those of us who came from under those men, you are now included in as my as my babas, right? <laughs> um, wait, so someone just said they don't, you're ordering the book. Thank you, Sister Anissa. Just sorry you don't have to share with my students. That's okay, but you can share with your grandson when when you see him next and share with you know the group that we are a part of. So I appreciate you dearly more than my my limited uh words can can express. You want to show us something else? Can we end with this with the with the uh the video again on the book? Oh, sure, sure. So let me just say this. So for the people who are still here, thank you so much once again for popping in, popping out, for sharing it with those people who um who you have shared it with. And thank you, I know you will. Um I wanna say there's 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 no way I can say it anymore. I just want to say thank you for allowing me to be able to engage in a critical conversation with you, to have discourse, to have this discussion about um, not just the not just the work, but what the work means in terms of adding to our our library of the knowing, a library of our story, our library of antiquity, and how antiquity has to transfer thousands and thousands and thousands of years until it sits right in our lap. And that is what I want this show to be about. I want people who are sitting in a restaurant, minding their own business, <laughs> to pop over and see a welcome soul who would embrace. Like you had to read me when you walked in the room. First of all, it was just you and your partner and then myself and my friend. But you came up to me and I'm very thankful that you took that leap of faith and said, 
must be her smile. Let me come talk to her. <laughs> anyway, so we're gonna end with this uh, with this video about. Yes, thank you, Sister Annie. Yes, Barkley Hendricks. Hold on a second. Let me just pull him up. So, yes, Barkley Hendricks. I, she had to go look up and get some information. So, Barkley Hendricks, shout out to him, the coolest artist of the area. And, yes, Doriel. Oh, and I was at a Taino gathering, sitting in your car all the whole time. Oh, my goodness. Get out the car. Go in the house. <laughs> I'm blessed. I'm very blessed. Very blessed. All right. So, we're going to finish with this video about. Here we go about the book. I've spent decades in Egypt and Ethiopia and Sudan looking at the ancient artifacts and the ancient objects left behind that our people left behind in stone. Messages for the future, snapshots in stone about who they were and messages that have been there waiting for the future for us to retrieve. I invite you to come with me to the Blue Nile, to come with me and see the pictures in Sacred Nile that shows our legacy as a people of faith making. This book, Sacred Nile, will change how you see history, change how you see yourselves, and change how you see the sacred agency of people who look like us. Come with me from Ethiopia to Egypt. Travel the Nile, travel the history, travel our place and time. Sacred Nile is the book that you've been waiting for. And on that note, as I say, peace and blessings. This is a learn to grow you moment where I plant seeds to help you grow. I look forward to seeing you all next week. Some of you know I'll actually be hosting another show on Thursdays for the next three Thursdays uh, on a, a literature circle. Um, but I look forward to all of the people who say, hey, Doriel, you really need to meet this person. Doriel, this person has to be on your show. Doriel, have you, do you know about this person? Talk to them. Continue sending people my way. Uh, those of you who remember my post, there are 12 more sessions between now and the end of this year. You might want to make sure they get into one of those slots and about eight of them are already gone. I'm just saying, because 2023 is a whole different show. Peace and blessings once again. I will see you all on the next go round. This is a learn to grow you moment where I plant seeds to help you grow. Brother Chester, stay right there. <laughs>